So welcome to the ACAR at the NU student presentation session. Uh, we acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose lands, uh, whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders past and present. Uh, my name is Neha and I'll be uh, chairing today's session. Uh, we have uh, two student presenters today, um, uh, uh, Lucinda and Yastika, and we have our judges, uh, Tuka and Pritam today. Um, so our first presenter is Lucinda. Um, Lucinda, you can start whenever you're ready. Fantastic. Um, so hi, my name is Lucinda Beck. I'm a medical student from the University of Wollongong. And today I'd like to share with you my research project, which is on the attitudes of medical students and junior doctors towards the therapeutic use of psychedelic and psychoactive substances to treat mental illness. So despite the increasing burden disease of mental illness around the world, uh, there's been a lack in new um, pharmacological treatments in the past decade. Um, and there's been recent interest in the potential therapeutic effect of psychedelic and psychoactive substances to treat mental illnesses, including depression, anxiety, and substance use disorders. So psychedelic substances refer to um, mind expanding or mind altering drugs that alter thoughts and perceptions. Um, so this includes psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms um, and LSD. And psychoactive substances uh, refer to any substances that affect mental processes, such as cognition or affect. Um, and these substances include MDMA, also known as the street drug ecstasy, and ketamine, which is a common um, anaesthetic agent, but is also um, used as a mind altering um, drug. So around the world, there is a lot of research happening, but Australia is lagging in this field. And a proposed reason for this is the stigma towards these substances, um, which can come from govern government bodies um, and from health professionals themselves as well, um, and in turn affects the funding and backing of research studies. So as well as overseeing um, research trials, doctors also inform policy changes and um, implement new medicines. However, the opinions of Australian medical students and junior doctors who may be at the forefront um, of prescribing these potential medicines um, is unknown. So the aim of the study was to investigate the attitudes of Australian medical students and junior doctors towards the therapeutic use of and research into uh, psychedelic and psychoactive substances to treat mental illness and also to attempt to identify factors that influence those attitudes. Um, so we designed an online survey consisting of 34 questions, which we circulated um, among social media, targeting uh, medical students and junior doctors. And we used descriptive analysis and statistical analysis um, on the program Qualtrics. Uh, so we had 207 participants in the end from eight medical schools, seven hospitals across seven states and territories. Um, and down the bottom here, this graph um, shows us participant responses to the statement, I believe this psychedelic or psychoactive substance could be effectively used to treat people suffering from mental illness, such as depression, anxiety or addiction. Um, and we found that around half of participants um, agreed that these substances could be effectively used to treat mental illness. Um, the greatest agreement was um, with psilocybin um, and only 40% of participants agreed that MDMA could be effectively used to treat mental illness. We also asked participants questions um, around their belief of the harm and addictiveness of psychedelic and psychoactive substances. And we found that participants were similarly split between agreement, disagreement, or having a neutral position. Uh, then we looked at some factors um, that uh, may affect um, participants' response to the statement, um, I believe this psychedelic or psychoactive substance, we looked at psilocybin for this one, um, could be effectively used to treat people suffering from mental illnesses, such as depression, um, anxiety, or substance use disorders. And we found that um, people who had received a prior diagnosis of mental illness were um, more likely to agree with the statement um, than those who had not been diagnosed with a mental illness, and this was statistically significant. Similarly, um, participants who had ever taken a psychedelic or psychoactive substance 
were also more likely to agree with the statement than those who had not ever had never taken a psychedelic or psychoactive substance. Um, on the other hand, we found that participants with self-reported knowledge of the of research um, into psychedelic and psychoactive substances to treat mental illness, um, those with more self-reported knowledge were more likely, uh, sorry, with less self-reported knowledge were less likely to agree that these substances could be effectively used to treat mental illness um, than those with more reported uh, self-knowledge. And similarly, um, participants who believe that psychedelic and psychoactive substances are harmful and addictive were less likely to agree that they could be effectively used to treat mental illness. Um, finally, we also found that over three quarters of participants supported the ongoing research into the potential therapeutic effects of psilocybin, LSD, ketamine and MDMA. So there has not been a lot of literature um, around doctors opinions of the um, of the use of psychedelic and psychoactive substances to treat mental illness. Um, there has, however, been um, quite a lot of literature on doctors' opinions towards the medical use of um, cannabis, which is similar in that it's an illicit substance with um, uh, now it has prescribed medical uses. Um, so a study of Australian GPs found that around 56% supported the use of medical cannabis in particular um, contexts. Um, and GPs who didn't support the use of medical cannabis um, cited reasons including um, concerns over the um, efficacy and harm of medical cannabis, um, potential for abuse and dependence, as well as um, seeking cannabis for recreational uses. Um, the finding of our study that around a third of participants believe that psychedelic and psychoactive substances are harmful and addictive correlates to research of um, doctors um, and in the realm of medical cannabis and psychedelic and psychoactive substances, that they have often dual views about these substances. So these views can range from um, belief in their potential therapeutic potential, um, as well as concerns over um, the potential for adverse effects, including worsening psychological distress and addictiveness. Um, our finding that participants who believed psychedelic and psychoactive substances are harmful and addictive um, and had less self-reported knowledge of psychedelic research, the fact that they were less likely to believe that psychedelic and psychoactive substances could be effectively used to treat mental illness is in line with the literature on medical cannabis. So um, studies have found that doctors with negative beliefs and a lack of knowledge of medical cannabis um, were less likely to recommend it to their patients, um, even patients with qualifying conditions. Um, and this has been identified as a barrier for um, patients being able to access this medicine with, uh, who have qualifying conditions. Um, so what this uh, research may suggest is that if um, psychedelic and psychoactive substances are deemed to be safe and effective for use in certain conditions, um, stigma around these medicines may play a role in doctors' willingness to accept and recommend these um, substances. So um, in conclusion, understanding doctors' views on using psychedelic and psycho psychoactive substances as therapy for mental illness, as well as identifying factors, factors that influence um, their attitudes, may help to identify barriers to further research of psychedelic and psychoactive substances in Australia. Um, and hopefully this survey um, may help to inform current and future policy discussions surrounding this emerging field of psychedelic and psychoactive substance um, therapy research, um, as well as maybe guide education programs aimed at raising awareness and reducing stigma of psychedelic and psychoactive substances within the medical profession. Thank you. Thank you, Lucinda. Great presentation. Um, so now we'll start with Q&A. We have five minutes of Q&A. Uh, judges, do you have any questions? Um, well, th thank you for that presentation. Um, that was, yeah, really um, well delivered. And uh, I was just wondering, uh, why do you yourself stand on this question um, in terms of using psychedelic and psychoactive substances to treat mental illness? Um, I 
I believe that um, the increasing burden of disease of mental illness is a significant, if one of the greatest sort of public health issues that we face at the moment. And I do believe that the current therapies we have are not adequately um, addressing the different conditions that people are faced with. Um, so I'm open to new um, medicines and new um, solutions, I suppose. Um, so I definitely support more research. I guess I think what needs to happen in this field is um, really careful research in finding correct um, medicine dosing regimes and things like that as they have found that for some participants these substances are un, um, not for them and that can actually cause psychological harm so they need to be given in very particular circumstances um, so I think a lot more research needs to happen um, and I guess my other concern about it is that this is sort of ch such a charged um, field in that it relates back to these substances being banned in the 60s, um, having a whole uh, degree of stigma generated against them, that I think if this research isn't done carefully, um, that we could end up having these substances taken um, out of the realm of um, medical research again, as they were in the 60s. Um, and I'm aware that um, there are various private industries seeing that this could be a potentially um, very, uh, what's the word, could, could be a very, um, could be a um, successful business, I suppose. Um, and so there may be, um, I guess, people who might be jumping hoops and not doing things um, carefully and selecting patients carefully. And so um, I want to make sure, I, yeah, I hope that it's done uh, very kind of slowly and with proper scientific rigor. Okay, great. Thank you very much for your response. Hi, Lucinda. Uh, Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, uh, uh, sorry. Like, thanks for this excellent presentation. And like, the topic really seems interesting. And with, I think, the changing people's belief to uh, like many drugs, I think you are right when you talk about this, how this will evolve. I was just wondering that if your research or if you know in your group that research has an intersection with criminal law or like law in particular, because in many countries, many of these drugs are still within the prohibited substances, even like I will say from a medical point of view also. So how does your research interact with like the idea that many substances and this abuse are still criminalized and like what's the way forward regarding all those issues? Mm. Well, I suppose, um, I mean, because this was a survey and I couldn't um, get more detail about why people selected certain responses, which I'd like to do in the future, um, but it still gave us an idea that um, there are a significant portion of people, one third, and one third selected neutral, so we're not sure really what that means, who do believe that these substances are harmful and addictive. Mm. Um, and it's possible that these so that this relates to um, the fact that they, they are illicit substances. So in Australia, they're Schedule 9, which means um, they're banned substances, essentially. So they Schedule 8 is the next level down, which is what medical cannabis is, isn't it? It's an illegal drug, but it has um, it's legal in certain medical uses. Um, so... The fact that, yeah, they're still in this Schedule 9 position, hopefully this, um, I guess, research might show that um, potentially a lot of that is to do with the stigma that was generated when these substances were banned in 1967. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, I guess um, just recently they, uh, the government gave $15 million of funding towards um, research into psilocybin and MDMA, but they, the um, Therapeutic Goods Administration simultaneously decided to keep those drugs as Schedule 9, which means that even if they found, uh, currently, if they found they were to be um, safe and effective, they couldn't actually implement them into um, clinics because they're still illicit. So I guess hopefully this just uh, maybe also elucidates um, health professionals' concerns um, over these substances, which are really important to keep in mind. And they aren't substances that anyone can take, you know, 
um, daily sort of thing. They are substances that have very powerful effects. So it is important to keep that in mind, but also maybe important to realize that some of this fear around these substances is due to stigma. Um, and if we can kind of change people's ideas about that, then we might be able to um, reduce the criminality associated with these substances. Thank you for your response. Awesome. Uh, Lucinda, we have a question from uh, the audience also. Uh, so what do you think the implications are on people who have been arrested or had police interactions due to using these sorts of drugs for their own self-medication? Um, so the implications of this research? Um, so implications on uh, people who have been arrested or had police interactions due to use of these uh, kind of medications um, like by themselves. So own self-medication, not mm. um, taking the permission and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so I think it's yeah really important to acknowledge that people have been self-medicating with these substances. Um, it's been documented for a long time now. Um, and that uh, it's, it, there's literature to suggest that particularly psilocybin, um, LSD and MDMA have um, no uh, evidence of being addictive substances. Um, so we, we know that about them. Ketamine has the potential of abuse. Um, but yeah, for, the, for people that have been, um, I guess, involved in the justice system due to using these um, substances for uh, self-medication, um, personally, I, I believe that is um, really sad and that that's a, um, a product of the law, which is, um, to me, I feel is outdated and in a lot of countries they are changing their laws towards these substances and that these substances are being um, legalized in some states in America um, and being decriminalized in other countries. So I'm, I'm hoping that Australia will um, head in that direction soon. Um, but for now, unfortunately, these substances are illicit and it's really important for people to keep that in mind um, if they are wanting to, I guess, experiment with these substances, that they are, um, it, it, they are illegal and they carry quite hefty um, criminal charges. So, yeah, unfortunately, that's the reality at the moment, but I hope that will change. Awesome. Um, thanks, Lucinda, for the presentation. Uh, so let's move on to our next presenter, uh, Yastika. Hello everyone, my name is Yastika Banerjee and I am currently doing my Molecular Biotechnology Honours in the University of Queensland at Queensland Alliance of Agriculture and Food Innovation. And this project was done in, as a summer research in 2020 before I just started my honours. So to begin with, um, Clostridium porphyringens is a gram-positive and aerobic bacterium with strains type A, B and C respectively. Type A strain of this bacterium releases a toxin called necrotic toxin B, also called NetB, which is cytotoxic to avian cells. This toxin, NetB, causes several human and animal diseases, but my project focuses on animals. So in chickens, NetB causes necrotic enteritis, and the clinical symptoms of acute necrotic enteritis include diarrhea, ruffled feathers, etc. And in most of the scenarios, the chickens die within hours. Whereas the subclinical symptoms of the disease are decrease, decrease in appetite and gross necrotic lesions in small intestinal mucosa. Treating necrotic enteritis is possible with antimicrobials, but due to the rapid progression of the disease, untimely death of chickens is frequent. And as such, the poultry industry runs in a loss of more than 2 billion USD per year. It is known that herpes viruses are amenable to deliver antigen as a live viral vaccine vector and are currently used to prevent a neoplastic disease in the poultry called Marek's disease. And it is done with the help of, a, of herpes viruses in Turkey, HVT. Since necrotic enteritis is a significant problem in the global protein production enterprise, 
the identification of protein net B is a significant problem in the global poultry production. And that's why necrotic enteritis and net B makes a potential candidate for vaccine development. Therefore, the aim of my project is to develop a herpes live viral vaccine vector harboring a non-toxic but immunogenic net B expression cassette. Since herpes viruses of Turkey is used to control Marek's disease, our main aim was to potentially use herpes viruses of Turkey as a bivalent live viral vaccine backbone. But HVT is highly refractile to transposition and the transposon mu A net B is approximately 3.8 kilobases, which makes the transposition even more difficult. Therefore, bovine herpes virus 1, strain 155, was chosen as a viral vector backbone for developing this vaccine. The reason behind choosing BHV1, or bovine herpes virus 1, as a backbone was because it, comp it comprised of several non-essential genes, making the gene editing more malleable. The DNA can be edited by insertion, deletion, translocation, etc. The plasmin PBAC BHV37, which is basically bovine herpes virus 1, maintain a DH10B cells and the transposon new way net to be optimized were already prepared by my supervisor, Dr. Carl Robinson, and my co-supervisor, Dr. Uh, Pr Professor Timothy Mauni, respectively. The plasmid bacteria, uh, PBAC, BHV37, was extracted with Kiagen mini prep, followed by a transposition reaction among the DNA, number one, the DNA, PBAC, BHV37, number two, the transposon net B, and number three, the transposase mu A. Aliquots of the transposition reactions were electroporated in the electrocompetent E. coli DH10B cells with the help of QS. After which, the cells were incubated at 37 degrees Celsius for an hour, and then the cells were plated in their respective test plates that were, that were the cap can plates and the control plates that were the cap plates. As a result, we successfully got four colonies of recombinant back DNA, or also known as DH10B, mu A, net B optimized, PBAC BHV37, were grown as seen in figure one in plates A and B, and several colonies were grown in plate C, as plate C was a control plate. Shows a PCR that was done to confirm the transposition reaction. A restriction digest by Salva. Uh, yes, sir, there's some there's some background noise. Um, if, I mean, it, it's it's a uh, disturbing. Where is you? Does that slow? Yeah, it's maybe it's in your mic. Um, hello, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me now properly? Yeah, yeah, all right. Um, I'll just continue then. Um, so Figure two shows a PCR that confirms a potential transposition reaction, followed by a di restriction digest was done with SAL1 in figure three. The stars in figure three indicate um, the differences in the banding patterns putatively due to mu A net B transposition events. Followed by table one, indicating the sequencing data of the genome to know where the transposition has actually taken place. However, the sequencing data, have, we haven't received the sequencing data as of yet. In figure four, you will, uh, you will see that the transfection of this, it basically indicates the transfection of cells with respective to PBAC BHV37 clones transformed with mu and net B was conducted. 
definite cytopathic effect in mu A transposed clones were not observed. However, potential virus foci was observed. Cell monolayers were freeze thawed and blind passage onto fresh Martin Darwin bovine kidney cells. In conclusion, for proof of concept that a bacterial toxin gene can be expressed from a viral vaccine vector backbone, we transpose the vaccine vector for vector P back BHV37 with net B. And we observed that we successfully recovered four clones of recombinant back DNA after the transposition reaction. The PCR confirmed the recovered clones and the expression of net B cassettes that is present in the extracted back DNA, followed by the restriction enzyme profiling, suggesting no large deletions or reversions have occurred with the banding pattern differences which is most likely due to the transposition events. Followed by um, modified PBAC BHV37 net, net B clones were successfully transfected into MDBK cells and the cytopathic effect was notice, noticed only in the controls. Presently, blind passage of the recombinant back DNA, transfecting the monolayers is ongoing due to tentative CP observation. And for future studies, it is essential to work on potential strategies to express NetB in HBT with the help of CRISPR-Cas9 to actually make the vaccine available to the world and help as many poultry industries we can globally in Australia and also help the chicken lovers to eat more chicken. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks, Jessica, for that great presentation. Uh, so judges, do you have any questions? Um, yep, yeah, I may go first unless Pritam you have something in mind. Um, all right, yeah, I'll go first. Uh, so yeah, again, uh, thank you uh, for the presentation, Mystica. Um, so I suppose for someone who is not an expert in this area, I was wondering that besides um, the use development of this vaccine for a poultry industry, are there other sort of more generalizable applications or lessons that can be taken from the research that you have been doing? Well, absolutely. I think, um, uh, as you can see, COVID-19, this is a big indication that um, I have heard conspiracies which talks about why Pfizer is better than AstraZeneca because of the because AstraZeneca is a viral vector that is being introduced into the body and uh, Pfizer is an mRNA vaccine. So the, the thing that so this what vaccine I have designed or we have designed is uh, talks about how viral vectors are very implicable or how useful they are in the world. And uh, the thing is that with CRISPR, um, it makes things even more easier and uh, it is easy to make uh, vaccines. Obviously, science can go wrong, but at the same time, it's quite convenient to make, quite convenient and efficient to make viral vector vaccines available to the world to actually help as many people, animal industries as possible. So that's what I have actually taken into consideration. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi, Estika, and thanks for the uh, uh, like presentation. I do not have a, like a question like per se, but like more of a like a understanding. I want to understand something because I have totally no idea about this area. Okay, what I want to know is it how do you like how does your research engage with industry now? Like, are you like looking for like future industry engagement, and how you are going forward with the research? Because as far as I can understand, this is that obviously you have a potential implication over it and for a mass development of the vaccines that you're talking about. So is there research in that stage where you can go forward with this? Yes. Um, so this, uh, this project was a proof of concept for potential vaccines that I can make with herpes viruses of Turkey. However, Queensland Alliance of Agriculture and Food Innovation works with Queensland government. So uh, we have the funding to actually take it to clinical trials, phase one, phase two, further on down the line to actually help people. Okay, that's nice. 
Great. Um, anyone from the audience, if you have any questions, you can put it in the chat or you could raise your hand. Um, hi, I, that was a great um, research um, project. I'm very impressed. I was Thank just you. wondering, what do you think is the most sort of challenging part about um, your, about the methodology, about designing this kind of, um, yeah, viral vector? Oh, um, honestly, if you actually ask me, the hardest part is to sleep at night, not knowing what the result's going to be tomorrow. Even if you have negative results, it's okay. But that anxiety it kills me. That's when you need your medicines. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yes, apart from that, I think um, in this reaction, anything could have gone in this uh, research, anything could have gone wrong. I felt the transposition reaction, which involved all the DNA, the transpose, so many elements and anything, if you mess up the concentration of any element, it could have gone wrong. So I think that was the really hardest part, I'd say. Thank you guys for the great presentations, great questions and um, obviously great answers. So uh, yes, we are at the end of our session. Um, so I'd like to thank the presenters again. Thanks Lucinda, thanks Yastika for your great presentations. Um, thanks to the judges, uh, Tupa and Pritham, to take out your time and judge the uh, presentations. Um, the recording will be available online uh, after the conference and we hope to see you all in other conference events. And yep, uh, thank you all. I'll be stopping the recording. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you very much.